I consider myself a humanist first, and that's not a cop-out. Ultimately, isn't that where we want to be? Everyone respected for who they truly are and their talents, regardless of their outer appearance. No labels. I thought that by now we would be past so many things. When I was young, I really thought that the future would be like the bridge of the Starship Enterprise. <laughs> Science fiction, movies, art, and music were my mental escape from the small town where I grew up between Athens and Atlanta. I moved to Athens when I was 17 years old to attend the University of Georgia. After a couple of years, I switched my major from art education to drawing and painting, which was a bit of a disappointment to my father. There was an interesting group of teachers and students centered in the art department at the time, and I wanted to be a part of that. I met Michael Lehusky in an independent study class given by Robert Kroger, who gave parties of biblical proportions. I mean, literally, biblical proportions. 24-hour party. <laughs> I took color theory from Judith McWelly and painting from Jim Herbert. The art students and their teachers formed the core of what became the Athens music scene. I hung around Athens after graduating in the spring of 1978, waiting for my first husband, Jimmy Ellison, to graduate. And that year after school, I went to parties and concerts in Athens and Atlanta, made art, fish shopped, and worked two jobs. Fellow Athenians, the B-52s, had started performing in 1977 and were taking off like a rocket ship. I saw them whenever they were in the area, and that meant driving to Atlanta. We just drive to Atlanta to see them. And new music records were available, available at Chapter 3 downtown, and old ones at Orts Oldies. I bought some records without hearing them just on the basis of the cover art. I especially love singles, and you know, I still do. That's my thing. Two of my friends from art school, Michael LaHusky and Randy Bewley, had started working on a mu music project in late 1978. I kind of knew about it, but wasn't involved in the process. My friend Rhonda Fleming and I would dress up and dance together at concerts doing nine dances, freezing in poses, checking our watches or saying things like, it's time for fashion. <laughs> <laughs> Once we painted each other's toenails on the dance floor, and this isn't in the book, but we had on hose, <laughs> and it was in Atlanta as we wore a ballroom, and we were laying out in the middle of the floor painting our toenails <laughs> through our hose. <laughs> On Valentine's Day, 1979, Randy appeared at the J.C. Penney catalog department where I was working and asked if I would like to try out for his new band that night. I said, sure. It sounded like a fun thing to do. I had nothing better to do. When I got to the rehearsal space that night, drummer Curtis Crow, Michael on bass, and Randy on guitar were waiting, already set up to play. A music stand with lyrics and an orange colored binder was ready next to a microphone. They played several songs. I would listen first and then try to make the lyrics fit the music. They thanked me for coming by and I left. I did not know that they had already auditioned several guys who were on the verge of using found and pre-recorded sounds for the vocals. The next day, Randy called me up and said, you're in. I think the fact that I tried to make the lyrics work in some fashion was in my favor, and they liked me as well. We were all on the same wavelength. I discovered that Randy and Michael wanted to go to New York, get written up in New York Rocker, and then disband. 
<laughs> sounded like a feasible idea to me and that's going to take up too much of my time. <laughs> How'd that work out? <laughs> Here I am like 38 years later, whatever it is. Michael and I both worked on the weekends at a local factory that specialized in textile fat fibers which were loaded onto enormous beams from long creels containing thousands of bobbins of thread. We were surrounded by colored dots on the floor, orange safety cones, yellow and black striped tape, and signs that implored us to be safe and warned us of various dangers using international symbols. When we saw each other on break, we discussed band names and had a list going. Michael's idea in the beginning was to use some sort of symbol to represent the band, like a diagonal, for instance. Not even a word, just have a diagonal. <laughs> and that was on the top of the list at first. <laughs> the orange safety cones that surrounded us at the factory were called pylons. We liked the image and decide, decided to use the name after discussing it with the rest of the band. Pylon practiced several weeks for our first show on March 9th with the Tone Tones of both Chapter 3 records. The audience just stood and stared at us. <laughs> I don't think they knew what to make of us. The same reaction followed at their second show at Curtis's Loft, the original 40 Watt. At our third show, way out in Oglethorpe County in an old brick farmhouse surrounded by green fields, the B-52 showed up. They just started dancing like crazy and the party really got started. Kate and Fred said that they would help us get booked in New York City. We made them some cassettes and they took them to the hottest club at the time, Hurrah. Jim Farrat booked us right away on their recommendation. And I mean, really, you know, seriously, um, they just played at Hurrah, and people were, you know how big a block is in New York City? People were lined up all the way around to get in to see them. They were very hot. About six months after I joined the band, Pylon opened for our heroes, Gang of Four, on August 22nd, 1979. We performed in New York before we played in Atlanta, <laughs> which is kind of hilarious, it really is. Glenn O'Brien covered the show in his column Beat in Interview Magazine. He said that it sounded like we ate dub for breakfast. <laughs> we had no idea what dub was and used the word in the song that became the B-side to our first single, Cool Dub, released by D.B. Rex in January 1980. Much later, in March 1981, we were written up by Karen Mylene in a cover story for New York Rocker. An article inside about three other bands to watch included Blood Tractor, Side Effects, and a band called R.E.M. <laughs> <laughs>